All right, so we're going to get started today um, on another one of our page spreads. And um, today I'm inspired to work with Kuan Yin. So as I'm working and building this collage, I will do a little storytelling um, about Kuan Yin and how there are other goddesses in various cultures that are very similar to her. So a part of what I'm hoping we'll weave in this process is beginning to recognize the similarity in goddess stories. Like, you know, it's the same type of arch same basic archetype, but by different names. So we'll explore some of that today. In the meantime, we're going to get started. I have a printout of a Kuan Yin that I really liked. And then I just pulled some things that I think I want us to be able to start working with. I have some vintage text. I've just kind of have a a grouping of things that, you know, that I'll be using. Let's see how they work. So today we're going to look at Quan Yin. As you can see from the beautiful um, picture here of her, I'm making a decision on which one I want to go with. It's slight differences I used in my um, right hand, that's Crane, 100% um, cotton. And in my left hand is Hammer Mill, um, premium color copy paper. I like both of them, but I'm going to go with the um, the crane because it's it's a warmer color and the variation was just slight enough but I could tell that that's kind of where I wanted to go so I'm gonna start off by cutting this out and as I work on my collage we're going to talk about Kuan Yin today and other versions of the mother as goddess that will show up in various cultures that um, are similar to the qualities of Kuan Yin you're probably beginning to notice that though we can see the goddess mother, mother earth, earth as, as the great mother in the various stories, we're not only noticing the similarities, but we're seeing how the stories will um, rank very closely together. So the last time we were talking about creation story, stories, and so many of the creation stories are similar. And we just picked a handful of um, examples of the mother in various indigenous um, in the Mer in America, North America culture. With Kuan Yin, we're looking not only at the Asian culture, but we're gonna look a little bit more globally at how, where she's showing up in a number of cultures across the various continents. Now, why Kuan Yin? I tell you, I have been connected to Kuan Yin ever since I was a little girl. The earliest point that she came into my life, I can remember I was probably about maybe four, four and a half years old, not more than five. And um, my parents had recently redecorated the living room or were decorating the living room with yeah new furniture. And they brought this lamp in and this lamp was just a gorgeous lamp. I remember I would sit on the sofa and just look at this lamp. And it was so compelling. And back then, my parents refu referred to it as Buddha. You know, it was the, the 60s. You know, you always had Buddha statues and love and peace was everywhere, right? So um, I always thought that it was Buddha. I didn't know. But I just felt that I was always compelled um, looking at it, it was almost very meditative. I could sit there for hours and just be in the presence of this lamp, not just staring at it necessarily, sometimes looking at it, sometimes just reading, just doing other things that you do as a little kid, right? But I found it very comforting. It wasn't until as I continue to move into my my late teens and my early 20s and I went away to college and things like this, that, that this sculpture this this figure kept on showing up again i always thought that it was buddha i just thought oh, it's a buddha you know and i didn't necessarily particularly connect to buddha so i wasn't always sure what i was connecting to so it wasn't until probably in my late 30s that i came to understand that it wasn't buddha it was kuan yin and then i thought you know what wait a minute it did have the hair piled up on the top of the hair in a very female type of hairdress over what we normally see in the bodhisattvas of the male um, incarnations of Buddha. And so um, 
and you know and i constantly would be attracted to the various sculptures and you know small figurines and stuff would always come into my life and I, it, I was always amazed by this process, but I just collected a lot of Kuan Yin. And then I began to really connect with the story of Kuan Yin and later realized that a lot of my own sort of nature is kind of in the realm of these type of goddesses. You know, <laughs> Callie could very easily work in this in this category, though I've chosen a, a different um deity to speak of because this one is a little closer to the various um consorts and attributions of um Quan Yin. So let's start talking about her. So I had to tell you why Quan Yin cuz I love 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 the spirit of Quan Yin and she's always with me. And um and I think that's probably why I have this deep deep connection and love with Asian culture and logo graphics and symbols and things like that because I think at a very deep core DNA level it really is one of the aspects of the goddess that I really connect with. So Kuan Yin is a Buddhist goddess known for her compassion, mercy, and healing powers. She is often depicted holding a vase of healing nectar and a lotus flower. According to legend, Kuan Yin was once a mortal woman who achieved enlightenment and was granted immortality. Now, there's three stories that are pretty prominent stories about Kuan Yin that I'll share with you, though there's lots of stories of Kuan Yin, right? Because she's a very much a living goddess and mother in um, the Asian culture. So as that goes, we always have lots of stories, but I'm gonna share these three with you because they're more common. Now here I'm looking through my stash of um, some of my papers, um, looking for something else to work with that background. So one of the most well-known stories of Kuan Yin involves her sacrifice to help others. In this story, she was approached by a desperate mother whose child was very ill. Kuan Yin told the mother to gather all the mustard seeds from every household in the village. The mother did so, but she was unable to find a single household that had not been touched by illness or death. Realizing the universality of suffering, Kuan Yin chose to give up her own immortality to help all living beings. It's pretty profound. Another story tells of Kuan Yin's journey to the underworld to rescue souls. In this tale, she descends into the realm of the dead to free the souls of those who have been trapped there. She is able to do so by using her compassion to melt the icy hearts of the underworld's guardians. Now, Kuan Yin is also associated with the lotus flower, which symbolizes purity and enlightenment. According to legend, she was once a princess who renounced her royal status to become a nun. She was so pure and virtuous that a lotus flower bloomed and her footsteps wherever she walked. <laughs> so overall, the stories of Kuan Yin demonstrate the power of compassion and selfish, selflessness. She is revered by many as a source of comfort and healing, and her legend continues to inspire people around the world. Boy, I like to be that pure that every step I took, a lotus blossom popped up. But what a beautiful, a beautiful visual for a painting or something. These stories just inspire so many visuals in me, which I, which I, which is why I love them, and this series that we're doing together. And so many of you seem to be enjoying these stories. It's like, like I'm so happy because. I never thought about being able to take my love for anthropology, which has to do with cultural storytelling. I love cultural stories and be able to infuse it in this community while we're doing our art and our journaling. So I have so much um, gratitude for all of you all being on this journey with me and really enjoying this process. So once again, I have to thank you all. And I love the comment and the stories that you've begun to share with me. And actually one of the stories um, that I've chosen in um, our stories today is from one um, that reached out from Germany. So when it comes up, we'll talk about it. Okay, so overall, um, Kuan Yin's key qualities is her compassion. 
She is said to have the ability to feel the suffering of others and to offer them comfort and healing, right? So this compassion can be a source of strength and, and inspiration for her believers. And um, you can look to Kuan Yin as a role model for how to treat others with kindness and understanding. Another important quality of Kuan Yin is her mercy. She is known for her ability to forgive and to offer second chances to those who have strayed from the path of righteousness. This quality can be particularly helpful for believers who may be struggling with feelings of guilt, shame, and shame as they can turn to Kuan Yin for forgiveness and understanding. How beautiful to have that opportunity in... Um, the mother, right? And finally, Kuan Yin is also associated with the wisdom of insight. She is said to possess a deep understanding of the human experience and to be able to offer guidance and advice to those who seek it. This wisdom can be valuable resource for believers who are facing difficult decisions or who are seeking to deepen their spiritual practice. So overall, Kuan Yin's qualities as a goddess can be a source of inspiration, comfort, and guidance for believers. And whether through her compassion, her mercy, or her wisdom, Kuan Yin offers a powerful example of how to live a life of kindness, understanding, and spiritual growth. So with, with looking into Kuan Yin, we begin to see a later version of the mother who resurrected herself from the ashes of feudal times when humanity was overtaking with war and minds and the gentle ways of the people and the ancient indigenous cultures were usurped. So we're moving into sort of like different aspect of the mother than we did with the indigenous stories of creation. And we'll move back and forth through these various time periods in the incarnations of the mother. But what I'm hoping is that we also will begin to recognize what version and what incarnation and even what period in time that part of the mother was birthed and there was a need for those type of stories and those type of um, the aspects of her. So, um, during these times when, um, you know, we were, there was a lot of this sort of worrying, you know, things going, theme was going on in uh, cultures. This led to the mother becoming embodied protection and tempting to anchor compassion while confronting annihilation. So in my personal research, I've created a category that acknowledges the transformation of the mother goddesses in an iteration of herself necessary to protect and survive the age of conquering. The following goddesses, along with Kuan Yin, embody this in their story. So listen for the similarities and you two will begin to, to be able to see our Paleolithic sister transformed into the goddesses, in, um, these warring goddesses in their stories. So there's a number of goddesses. I'll name a few of them. I apologize in advance for some of the pronunciation because I'm not familiar with all of the, the pronunciations here, but I'll give it my best attempt. Um, so a few of them would be Kanan, which is Japanese, Tara, which is Tibetan, um, in Tibetan Buddhism. So Guan Yin in China, Isis in Egypt, Aphrodite, in, which is Greek, Lakshmi, Hindu, um, Freya, which is a Nor in Norse mythology, and um, Kotelku, in, which is Aztec, White Buffalo Calf Woman, which is Lakoa Sioux, um, Lakota Sioux, and then Oshan, which is or Yoruba. So I kind of selected ones from just about every continent here. And we're going to go through a few of these. So we'll start with Lakshmi. She's an Hindu goddess associated with wealth, prosperity, and fertility. She is often depicted wearing a red dress and holding a lotus flower, symbolizing purity and abundance. And we know that similarly, Kuan Yin is associated with the lotus. In Hindu mythology, Lakshmi is believed to have merged from the churning of the cosmic ocean, here again water, and Kuan Yin is water, and uh, chose and chosen Vishnu, the preserver god, as her consort. Together they embodied the ideal of happy and prosperous household. Lakshmi also worshipped the festival of Diwali, where she is believed to bring good fortune and blessings to homes and businesses. Many people 
um, also offer prayers to her for success in their personal and uh, professional lives. So overall, Lakshmi is revered and beloved goddess in Hinduism, representing the ideals of wealth, prosperity, and happiness. So Kuan Yin and Lakshmi are both goddesses. Um, they're, re re they're revered from, you know, of course, in different cultures, but their similar traits would be the compassion, fertility, prosperity, and protection. Um, and where Kuan Yin is associated with healing, liberation, and mercy, Lakshmi is associated with wealth, beauty, and good fortune. Um, but both goddesses are depicted with having multiple arms. The multiple arms meant, if you've never studied um, the tradition of the goddesses with the multiple arms, it meant that they had the ability to do every implement that's in their hands, that's something that they're able to move towards and use um, and have. It's like almost like their superpower. That's a thing that they can do, as, uh, you know, that they are able to do as a goddess. So each of those implements generally refer to what that goddess can do. So that's what the multiple hands are all about. Um, so let's see. They also, um, so they are able to do, perform multiple tasks simultaneously because they have all these arms. And so it's almost like how we are, you know, um, if you've parented before, you know, sometimes you have to have a few things going, you know, a number of arms would be really nice. And so this idea of multitasking overall, all there are both, they are both powerful and benevolent figures that represent feminine divinity. So now we're going to move on to Freya. Now Freya is from the Nords mythology. And I know that um, one of you in the community reached out to me and I apologize that right now I don't have your name written down in front of me, but you asked me about um, Nerthus. Um, and you remembered a story that you were told a lot as a young child. And some of it was a little disturbing, you said, and rightfully so, but you connect it to that story. And so Nerthus is, an, in, is a version um, in Nord's mythology of, um, I mean, in German, Germanic mythology of um, Freya in the Nord's. And they're very similar stories. So some common traits as goddesses, both are associated with love, fertility, and beauty. They are also known for their compassion and healing abilities. In addition, um, let's see. In addition, they have similar stories of sacrifice and resurrection. Now, this is where things kind of get maybe seeming a little dark. Really, it's just very intense that the goddess had to really step up and resurrect herself as pure protection um, to deal with the idea of warring times and annihilation. So, um, so let's see. Freya was said to have sacrificed herself to bring peace to her people. Um, and Kuan Yin was believe, believed, and you also know similarly, Kuan Yin um, sacrificed her mortality, her immortality, for mortality to save her people. So here we have this, uh, this, sim this similar story of sacrifice, of the mother um, sacrificing for the children. But also in the Norse, Freya as, as, in the Nor as a Norse goddess associated with love, fertility, war, and death. She is known for her beauty, strength, and wisdom. As a goddess of love, she often depicted as a passionate and sensual figure. And is said to have had many lovers. In addition to her role as goddess of love, Freya is also associated with fertility and is often invoked by those seeking to conceive children and ensure successful pre pregnancy. As a goddess of war, Freya is said to have led the um, Falkyries, female warriors, who chose the bravest and most worthy warriors to enter Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain. She is also known to have um, skill in magic and is said to have taught the art of Sidir, a form of Norse magic to Odin. So the thing with um, Freya, I wanted to also make sure I said, is that a lot of times, like the goddess Freya and then um, Nerthus, they are the same goddess. It's just in different cultures, they'll, they'll use a different name to describe them. So when you look at the different names for the goddess, sometimes go into the stories and then go into the cultural connections and you'll find that they're not necessarily different. They're just different names for the same goddess. 
So despite her association with death, Freya is also a goddess of life and is often associated with springtime because you know she also is revered for helping women through pregnancies and renewal. She sometimes depicted wearing a necklace called a brigsman and um, is said to have forged been forged by dwarves. Overall, Freya is a complex and multifaceted go goddess who embodies and who embodies many different aspects of life and death. Her influence can be seen in many aspects of Norse mythology and she continues to be an important figure in those cultures. Now we're going to go to um, Coltacul who is a Aztec goddess and she is starts getting a little fiercer you know you start seeing it rev up so um, but still beautiful stories. So once again both Kuan Yin and Kotokul, they, they depict nurturing figures who protect their respective cult, um, cultures. Additionally, both goddesses have been associated with water and are said to bring healing and purification. So she's a prominent deity in the Aztec mythology. She's often depicted as a fearsome goddess with a skirt made of serpents and a necklace made of hearts and hands. And according to the legend, she was the mother of the Aztec gods, including the sun and the moon. Her name was translated to mean one of the um, one with the skirt of serpents. And this name is fitting as she is often depicted wearing a skirt made of snakes in some versions of the myth, the stakes are also said to be Earth's fertility. In others, they symbolize the ability to shed one's skin and be reborn. So it's not the scary kind of version of the snake that we have in, in sort of Western cultures. It's a very beautiful, powerful um, figure. So the necklace of hearts and hands is said to represent the cycle of life and death. And we talked about that in the just the natural, you know, agrarian cycle of life and, and death. And she's also sometimes associated with earth and agric agriculture, as well as with warfare and human sacrifice. So despite her fearsome reputation, she is powerfully revered and is an important deity. And um, stories continue to inspire in her culture. Now, um, I want to talk about Oshun. So Oshun is out of the Yoruba tradition, and um, she's a goddess of love, fertility, and the rivers, while Kuan Yin also, you know, we know is associated with water, right? And that of mercy. So Oshun is, rever is um, revered in the Yoruba religion, originating in West Africa. She's the goddess of love, fertility, prosperity, and the river. Oshun is often as depicted as a beautiful woman adorned in gold jewelry and holding a fan. You know, the same with um, with Kuan Yin, the fan and the, um, the lotus. She's associated with sweetness and honey and the sensuality of the river. In Yoruba mythology, Oshun is known for her healing powers and her ability to provide abundance to those who honor her. She is also associated with the arts and particularly music and dance. Her energy is often believed to be calming and nurturing and many seek her guidance in matters of heart in the times of emotional turmoil. So, you know, here again, we can see that amazing connection with um, Kuan Yin. And we've looked at a number of cultures and a number of continents, and we're seeing these same powerful stories coming up. So I've finished this collage, and I'm down to the end where I want to put that ginkgo flower, which is from my latest stamp collection that's being released today, April 1st. I'm so excited. All the details are below for you guys if you're interested in getting any of these. And so I'm using the the white, I mean the red ink there that you use for for the um, the chops, the seals. And so I'm putting that down. And I also have another vintage um, iron one that I'm going to use just to kind of finish it off. I felt like need that little bit of red, but I loved all the papers the way they came together. I loved the. Um, the monochromatic sort of background that beautiful paper came from gypsy in, in new mexico when i went to the workshop she gifted that to me so i'm excited to be able to be able to have used it in this collage thanks again gypsy and um also the glue that i showed you earlier i was busy into my story that i didn't stop to say but that was the one i was using last week it's called glue g-l-o-o -O. so if you find it i actually am really liking that glue quite a bit so um, that was the one that we had there. So I think that's everything. Um, 
I hope you guys are in, you know, continue to be inspired by this series and are doing amazing things in your books, as I know that you are. I'm going to continue on the journey, you know, and I want to fill this up. This, to me, is going to become an anthology of the goddess as mother and mother as earth and all that good stuff. So until next week, love you all. Please thumb up the video if you enjoyed this. If you're new to the channel, hit the bell all so that you can subscribe and get all the notifications. When the notification comes up for premiere, hit notify me and then YouTube will send out a notification and you'll get it and you can come in and hang out with us. Love you guys. Bye-bye.